you're just going to change where that savings goes and it's going to go into your policy. When you take a loan from the policy, just like taking a loan from the 401k, it's going to pay something off or it's going to be used to make an, a return. You don't really have to work any harder for that. It's money you were giving away. So you just created passive income. So I got rid of the bank and I became the bank. Why would I ever stop paying my bank back? Cost is only an issue in the absence of value. You took back the banking functions in your life by using Nelson Nash's concept called the infinite banking concept. What's up everybody? Another week, another wealth webinar joined here by my trusted cat. His name is Lazy Cash. He is more famous than any of us. Also joining me, Mr. Snaggy. So let's get right into it. Today, we're going to cover three really important topics. Number one, we're going to talk about emergency funds. That's right. We're going to talk about that money that you have sitting aside for an emergency. And we're going to talk about some options with that. Number two, we're going to talk about assets and liabilities, but we're more specifically going to be talking about how liabilities can become assets for you in the future, but not just assets, income paying assets. So think about that. Like if you did a budget and you looked at where all your money's going, the credit card payments, the car payments, the boat payment, the loan payment, the mortgage payment, imagine that you converted all those liabilities into assets and all those assets paid you an income. That would be pretty cool. It's so simple. I'm going to show you how to do that. And I'm going to show you how that fixes the emergency fund thing that we're going to start with. And lastly, what we're really going to dive into is going to kind of be a hodgepodge of a few things, but I want to go into some numbers that we just did for a client. Uh, me and Craig worked with a really high level client, but I just want to, again, show you the numbers and the validity of what it is that we do. And I also then want to kind of take the the assets for liabilities and the liabilities converting to assets. And I want to show you how I literally just did this last week. It's great that I teach you how to do things. Do you know why I can teach you how to do these things, folks? Because I actually do them. It's amazing. You know, like, you know, we talked to, on, on the podcast with Pace Morby, you know, we were talking about this is like, how do we have these experiences that we can teach on? How can we, you know, tell hundreds of thousands of people like how to do something because we've done it and we do it every day and we continue to keep pushing the envelope. So I'm gonna literally show you something I did the other day that I think is cool. Some of you are like, duh, that's that's not cool at all. But when you see the, the return that I'm getting and, and how it has zero risk, zero risk, you're gonna love it. So that's what we're gonna go into. Before we get into that, I wanna let you know something that all this information will be recorded. And yes, it will be on my YouTube channel. So. Save yourself the time of asking, will this be recorded? Will we get a copy? You all have a copy. All you got to do is go to my YouTube channel, the one that we were just watching. You just go right here. And then all you're going to do is when you're on the YouTube channel, you're just going to subscribe. That's it. So when you go to YouTube, just like any YouTube channel, you just pull it up at the Chris Noggle. I know this is elementary for some people. You click that little guy there money is everywhere it's, it's very easy up. you can pause that and then you're just going to subscribe to the channel now i'm already subscribed but subscribe and then there's a little bell i don't know where that sucker went but you're just going to click the bell and make sure that you're notified and also what that's going to do is that's going to give you the information for when you want to join us for ask me anything or wtf every wealth webinar we do people are always asking us how do we get on ask me anything at 4 30 eastern today great that's how you do it. You, you subscribe to YouTube and you get notified every time we go live. How do we get on WTF? This morning I heard it was epic. It was epic. It was crazy. And yet that's how you do it, YouTube. So now that we got that work out of the way, let's dive in. First things first, I want to talk about emergency funds. How many of you just by in the chat, let's, let's get you all, we got 125 of you in climbing. How many of you have an emergency fund that you literally define as an emergency fund? In the uh, chat, what I want you to do is I just want you to put fund, F-U-N-D. I just want to see how many of you have a, an emergency fund. And if you don't have one, that's fine because we're going to cover that. Okay, so we got a bunch of people that said they have funds. Okay, an emergency fund. So the, to define an emergency fund, if you really went like with what most advisors would recommend, it's six months of household income. So if you lost your job tomorrow, something tragic happened, you ended up in the hospital and couldn't work, you have six months, you have a runway of six months 
of your basic expenses that you can take, take care of, right? That's essentially what it is. I always tell people three months in some scenarios is, is fine if you've got passive income. But if your income is solely W-2 income that if you can't work tomorrow, your income shuts off six months minimum. Okay, everybody got that? John said he's got three months and, and John has income. Okay, so he's got passive income coming in. Income that comes through the door, whether or not John goes to work or not, that's fine. Three months, more than sufficient if you've got the passive income that doesn't shut off. So that's what we define as an emergency fund. But largely emergency funds are usually bank accounts. Almost every time I ask people where their emergency fund money is, it's in a bank account. Usually it's in a checking account. Now, how many of you, and, and I just want to ask the audience, how many of you have your emergency fund in a different type of an account? Tell me what you've got. Like some of you might have emergency funds that are in brokerage accounts. Okay. Hopefully it's in money markets because you don't want to use emergency fund money as risk. You don't want to take any real risk with an emergency fund. Yeah. Money market safe in my house. Okay. That's a, so that's a real emergency fund. Anyone got money under their bed? I mean, like they used to during the depression. Anyone got money in their walls? That would be kind of cool. You know, you're like you take part of your wall down, you stuff a bunch of stacks of bills in and then you re drywall over it. I mean, listen, they used to do that stuff back in the 30s. Okay. Andy said he's got it in his policies, metals, money markets, smart. So it, me and Steven talk about that a lot with precious metals. Like I have silver. So I have a safe with a whole bunch of silver in it. And then I also have an emergency fund, but I don't use banks for my emergency fund. I think you all can figure out where that goes. A lot of people have high yield savings accounts, first lien, HELOC, that, that would be, the policy would be good because that's where my emergency fund is. But the first lien HELOC, you'd have to be careful because a first lien HELOC in a recessionary period or a time when banks are, are tightening, which we covered this morning and I'm going to hit it again, like HELOCs can get shut down. So you got to be really careful with home equity lines of credit. But that's great. Coins. Yeah, Jill's very careful with it. I know you are, Jill. Like you've been around the campfire forever. High yielding bank accounts. So those are all great answers. Now, with an emergency fund, the one thing I always like to preface is if you've got an emergency fund and it's in a bank, you know, most of you said that you didn't, but most of you had it in a high yield bank account. Let me ask you we have such short term memory. It's hilarious. Three years ago, how much did your high yielding savings account pay you? Anyone? How much did high yield savings accounts pay three years ago? 1% and that was gracious. If you found a 1% high yield savings account, boy, oh boy, you were a lot of people's friends because they're like, where is this special bank that pays 1%? Okay, but today, how much are you making? Yeah, that's, that's about half a percent is about right. But today, how much are you guys getting in your high yield savings accounts? Anyone getting five and a half? Four and a half is very common. And we've got something special. We always talk about segregated bank accounts in conjunction with your private banking systems that we help you set up. So we are, are I've got Brandon who just started and pretty soon you guys are going to get to know Brandon really well. He's going to be running the done for you division. Okay. Which is going to be really helpful for many of you. But what he does is he comes from the banking industry. He worked and ran a bank literally. So what he's been doing is researching all the high yield savings accounts out there, finding out which ones have good online platforms so that we then can basically tell you, hey, you want to set up a segregated account, an emergency fund, you're looking for a high yield savings. Here are the best ones right now. So we're going to continuously look for the best savings accounts, high yielding ones that have online banking functions. And we're going to basically give you a play by play. So if any of you are looking you don't have to go out and look very far because we're just going to hand spoon feed them to you, okay? Because that's what we're going to be providing. What we're trying to do with Money School and BYOB along with PMC is do all the work for you. Literally, I'm trying to give all of you the resources that we have built over the last decade of doing this stuff so you don't have to look far, so you don't have to go far. You just get around the campfire. You just become part of the campfire and the campfire takes care of itself. Like how many of you have ever been camping and you got a big group of people, everybody sitting around the fire, and the fire starts going down. The, the logs are almost burned out. How many of you have ever been in that scenario? Do you ever have to worry about that fire going out if there's a bunch of people around the campfire? No, because somebody's going to go find wood. And if there's no wood, you know damn well someone's going to go off in the woods and start hacking things down, bringing brush over, because you got a campfire. you got a bunch of people around a campfire. They won't let the fire go down. We protect our own. We want to keep everybody warm, and that's what we're bringing to you. So that's what we're going to do. Now, back to the emergency funds. 
a lot of you had bank accounts. Now, that's perfectly fine, and I'm, and I'm fine with that, but does anyone want to know why I don't use a bank account? I don't use a bank account, first off, because I don't trust banks. Second off, because I want my money earning a better return. And third off, now that banks are paying high interest rates, I hate, hate getting 1099s at the end of the year. And last off, I do some risky things. If I die tomorrow, I know that that bank account is going to go through probate and my family is going to have to wait to get that money in most cases, unless I have my wife on there as a joint owner of the account. So these are just some of the top line reasons why I do not use banks for my emergency fund. You all know what I use, right? Yeah, that's right. A specially designed and engineered whole life policy from a mutually owned insurance company that pays dividends. That's what I use. And the companies that I use, I just got a statement today from one of my policies. And that company, I've had that policy now three years. It just had its third anniversary. And guess what it is? It's efficient. What does that mean? I'm making more money than what I put into it every year. How much? It's right now about 4%. Next year will be about five. And then after that, it'll be six or seven, then eight or nine, then 10 or 11. Why does it go up? Well, it's not because the insurance company is super gracious and just loves giving me a raise. No, it's called mathematics. And the other cool thing about using the policy for an emergency fund is the money I put in the policy if something came up and I needed that money, I can take the money out of the policy and I can use it for that emergency. I can pay for my, you know, things that, you know, for six months or whatever it is. My, I mean, my emergency fund goes a lot further than just three or six months. I just wanted to set the baseline that that's the minimum you should have. But my policies, I don't just have one, provide an emergency fund that is far, far better than any bank account can because I can take the money out use it for the emergency and all my money's still earning interest and dividends uninterrupted. That's right. Your bank account, I'm sorry, no matter how good of a bank we find you or how good of a bank you found, no bank will allow you to take money from the bank account and still pay you interest on that money when it's gone. It doesn't happen. But the insurance companies can because when you take the money, you take a loan. Now, that's a swear word for some of you. They're like, I don't like taking loans. So I think this would be a good time for me to, to kind of just preface this and show this. So real quick, I'm just going to pull this up. Actually, here, let me, let me show you this one. It's probably, now these are big numbers, folks. Don't get hung up on the numbers here. This is just a client that we're working with. Almost any policy we design for you, that, just so you all know, full transparency. Okay, this is Lafayette Life. That's the company we're using here. And I, I can't remember, I think this is like a, I don't know, 80, 20 or a 90, 10 or something like that, the way we designed it. So it's a high, it's a high uh, cash value policy, maybe not appropriate for everybody's needs, but this person is going to use it to take it out. But here's what I want to show you. I want to show you the good and the bad right here. By the third year, I put 500,000 in, or this client puts 500,000 in. Again, it, I know it's a big number. So if you're like, oh my God, I could never do that. Great. Subtract a zero, subtract two zeros, it's five grand. The math is the same. Okay. It's just, this is the only one I had to show as an example for today. So again, don't get hung up on the big number. Just subtract some zeros. Some of you are like, shit, 500 is not enough. So add a zero. Heck, add two zeros. That would be cool. And if you're adding two zeros, let's call it, Let's do a call after we're done here. All right. So you put 500 in and you take 512, 250 out. How many of you would like that? How many of you would like to put 500,000 in your bank account and then you go out and you take 512 out. So hold on, let's just do the math because maybe that's not super sexy in today's rates. So think FCAT's making four and a half. So he gets 22. So yeah, some of you are looking at that being like, well, that sucks, Chris. If I put 500 in the bank account at four and a half percent, I make 22,500. That's better than the insurance company's 12,250. Oh yeah, well, check these apples out. How about if I die tomorrow, I get 8.7, or my, my, and I don't get anything. My family gets $8.7 million. That's not too shabby, right? So I didn't make as much as the bank, but I protected my family. But you see, here's where a lot of people get tricked. You just did the math on that. $22,500 is what a bank would pay you today on $500,000. And the policy net only gives you $12,250. But the, remember, the policy, the emergency fund that you're using the policy for is tax-free. So I don't know, this guy, he's in a probably pretty high tax bracket, but let's just take 30% off of that. So he made 15,750. So he still beat the policy after paying 30% in taxes, but you know what? Next year, he's not gonna beat the policy. 
And the year after, he's not going to beat the policy because the next year, he makes 36000 on his 500 he puts in. The next year, he makes 62000 All I'm showing you is if he puts 500 in in the fifth year, he can take 562 out. But here's the coolest part, okay? I'm just showing you numbers. I'm not trying to get too deep into this. Thank you, Nicholas. Yes, 90-10. So here, I don't care. Let's go up here, year three. If I took 512000 out and I lent it to one of you at 12%, do my numbers change? Does this number go down because the 512 is no longer in the account? Remember, I take the loan out and I basically lend it out or I do something with that money and I'm making 12. Or if I'm making, it doesn't matter what you're making. No, next year when I put 500 in, I'm still compounding on the full amount because the insurance company advances me money from their general account. Essentially, my debt benefit drops. So in the third year, I would reduce this 8.7 by 512. See how that works? Now, the insurance company charges me interest. They charge me 5%. So a lot of you are like, yeah, but if I put money in a bank, I don't, I don't have to pay the bank 5%. Okay, great, great. I like where you're at. Projected cash on cash return right here, 102. So you didn't really pay 5%. You paid 5 minus the 2.45 you made. But see, by the time you get to the fourth year, you made 107.25. So if you took the money out, if you took all 536 out, you made 107%. And if you had to give the insurance company back five of it, you still made two point, uh, what is that? 2.25%, not too shabby. But here's the other thing where this differentiates from a bank account. Yes, in the first couple of years, you're sucking wind, okay? So you gotta understand that. So if you're gonna do this for an emergency fund, please try not to have an emergency in the first three years. Because in the first year, if we put 500 in, we only have 447 to take out. So if I put 5,000 in, I might only have 4,473 that I can take out. You guys tracking? So the downside to using the policy as an emergency fund is usually in the first three years, highlighted by my little notes here. Because in this case, it's two years, but usually it's the first three years where you're not going to have as much, that you're going to put money in and you're not going to have enough or as much to take out as what you put in. So I know that's bad. How many of you right there would just say, nope, I would never use a policy for an emergency fund because the first three years? Okay, so there, there are people that would say that. There are lots of people we get on the phone and they're like, ah, I don't really love this policy. If I put 500 in, I wanna use my 500 because they're, they're trained on a bank account. Okay, but the bank account doesn't pay your family six, seven or $8 million in the first three years if you die now. So this is where you have to ask yourself a very difficult question. Do you love your family? I mean, it, it can be a difficult question, right? There are days where you're like, I don't know if I like you anymore. I, I know, I'm married. But then at the end of the day, you're like, I love my family. I love my kids. I love my kitty cat, even though, you know, he already gets the best food. So the death benefit wouldn't help him any. Maybe it would. Maybe Shauna would buy him some cat treats or some stuff like that. Anyway, you get the drift. So you have to put value on the what if I'm not here anymore. You have to put value on loving your family because if you don't put value on that, then this just probably doesn't make sense. The other thing I want to point out is from an emergency fund standpoint, if I suck wind for three years, if I gave up returns for three years so that after the third year, every year for the rest of my life, I make money. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. No matter what happens every day, Beyond that point, you have more money than you had the day before, and so on. And it just goes faster and faster. Look at these returns, 112, 117. So get rid of the 100. I know that's probably tripping people off. You're like, it's not 117% return. No, 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 it's 17.89. It's just the way we calculated the math. 23, and then down here, I mean, it jumps huge because we dropped the term. Notice how the term insurance, we get rid of that. See what that does to the return? Way better, okay? So now, now you're really cooking with oil. but. That's the thing you got to understand. I'm not sitting here and saying that this policy that we design for our clients is for everybody, but I make a pretty strong, compelling argument that it's hard to disagree that you give up three years of your life and you get a death benefit so that for the rest of your life, you have a positive tailwind behind your money and a really solid one. And folks, listen, this isn't hocus pocus shit. It's mathematics. That's the best part. Like the only thing that changes this is if math all of a sudden someday is determined to be flawed 
Like if someday someone says, hey, all that stuff you learned about math, like 1.1 equals two, that wasn't real. That was a lie. You've been lied to about math your whole life. No, 1.1 equals 16. That's the real math. Oh, I'm sorry. They're doing that in school today with Common Core. Forgot about that. Yeah. This is just mathematics. It's compounding interest, whether the money's in the account or not in the account. All right. So I'm going to move on from this. Does anyone have any questions? Stephen, do we have any questions on this? Nothing no. yet. No. Put in the Q&A. If anybody has questions, throw them in there. We'll answer as we go. So here's what I also wanted to show. This is a lot of numbers. So let me make it bigger. And then we're going to move on to the second part, which is converting assets to liabilities. I'm just making a compelling point that maybe instead of using a bank account for your emergency fund, you should use a policy because it gets to do double duty for you. So an emergency fund, the one thing that we find, and this is going to transition perfectly into the liabilities converting to assets. A lot of times when people put money okay, into a, an emergency fund at a bank, they never touch that money. It's kind of like sacred money. They don't touch it. It's just in case of an emergency. Now that money sitting in the bank today, yes, it could earn four and a half, five percent 5%. But when the Fed drops interest rates back down, you're back to earning close to nothing again. So you are not in control of the returns. Secondarily, if you take the money out, the money stops working for you. You see in the policy, the opposite happens. And I'm just gonna show you that in pure mathematics here. But we're gonna just start with year three. And then we're going to go to year four, because remember in year three, that was where we hit the positive. So a lot of numbers here. So I, again, I don't want anyone to get too hung up on the numbers. I just want you to understand there's three different columns. There's the policy, which we already talked about. Then there's the investment of where your money can go to work for you. And then there's the snapshot where we bring it all together. So let me, let me bring this thing home. I'll try to make this a little bigger so you guys can all see it. So everybody knows that this is, there we go. We'll use that. This is the third year right here. So we're gonna look here, the year where it was positive. I put 500 in, I take 486 out. So why am I not taking more than 500 out? Because I gotta leave money in the policy. Usually we can take 90% out, okay, of the cash value. So 72,000 is saying in the policy. For some of you, that would be enough for your emergency fund. For some of you, that would not be enough, okay? But I'm just trying to get you to think about this, that there's always going to be a residual cash value in the policy, even if the money goes to work. So as your emergency fund builds up, because you're saving money in it using the policy, there's always going to be money. So we could call that the emergency fund. But what we're going to really do is we want to make our emergency fund do double duty. So I'm going to take a loan every single year, which is what's shown. I took 486 out. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have that 486 go to work. So again, a lot of, lot of numbers because I do this every year. First year, I put 425 in, then I put another 467 or 464. And so I got 1.4 working and 1.4 earning interest. But the important thing is down here, the snapshot. This is just showing, okay, this is just showing the investment. And I think we show an investment here earning 12% alone. And I think we did this with the Fullers. So hopefully everybody's tracking and I will get to the, the cost. Actually, I don't know the cost of the term on this one, probably a lot because it's a big term rider. I bet you his term rider probably is like seven, eight grand in this policy, okay? But Dave Ramsey said, buy term, invest the difference. You know what? That's exactly what we're doing because that most of that death benefit that I showed you early on is term insurance. But let's come back over here. Year three, after taking all the money out, only leaving 72,000 in the policy, I still have all that money working for me. 1.376 million is still earning interest and dividends. So because of that, after I factor everything out, and I also want to preface that I am factoring in the loan interest. So each year I'm taking loans from the policy and I'm never paying the loans back. I'm just paying the interest on them. See it here? Interest, interest, interest. I'm making interest payments of 5% to the insurance company, but I'm making more than 5% on that money starting in year four, okay? Here I'm not, but starting in this year, I make more than what the insurance company charges me. So four years is my magic number in this particular policy. But once we factor in that money working for us twice, a lot of people love to think of an emergency fund. I just put money in a policy and I leave it there. No, that would take you four years to get positive. But if we don't keep it in the policy and we make it go to work for us, I can be positive from a return standpoint if I lend the money out in year one, year two, and year three. Here's the returns. I'm making 12% on my money. I'm paying interest on that money every single year that I have it. Remember that. I'm, I'm netting out all of this. Somebody had asked about the cost of the term insurance. Of course, that's netted out. This is net, net numbers. All factors, all expenses for running the policy, the policy service fees, the cost of insurance for the base, 
the cost of insurance for the term, our commission that we get paid, which is very small, but we still get paid a commission on 10% of this policy. All of that's out. And all we're doing is we've got the interest the policy's earning, which I showed you a second ago. And then we got the interest from the money working for us out there working right here, total of gain. Okay, this is the money working for us at 12%. So when we factor that in, we no longer have that drawdown in the first three years. We're positive every year because all your money is working for you instead of just sitting there lazy in a bank account because it's your emergency fund. So I'm just trying to make a compelling point that maybe, just maybe, if you save money in a bank account or somewhere else for an emergency fund, changing just one thing and where that is where that money goes first may make sense for you or it might not. I'm just showing you the numbers on it. Hopefully that helped. But now let's transition because this is something that gets me all the time and it drives me nuts. It drives Shauna nuts. It drives our team nuts. It drives Steven nuts. And that is this. When we look at somebody's assets, when we first meet somebody, we find a lot of things. We find money in a checking account, a savings account. A lot of you have 401ks, 403bs, 457s, you know, TSPs, all sorts of plans. And a lot of them have brokerage accounts. These are assets. You love these accounts. They make you feel good. When you get your statement at the end of the month, quarter, however you get them, it, you like seeing it, at least sometimes, not so much in the 401k or brokerage account. But the one thing a lot of our, our folks that we meet, especially in the beginning when we meet them, that they don't look at is they don't really pay too much attention to this side. Because I will tell you, almost everybody that we look at that has assets also has liabilities. They have credit cards, lines of credit, which these can be okay in some cases if that money's being used the right way. A lot of them have various loans, loans on equipment that they bought, loans on furniture that they bought. We see all sorts of loans. Almost everybody's got a car loan and almost everybody's got a lease. So what I want to do is I want to just play a game, okay? We're just going to play a game here. Remember I said, how fun would it be is if all the money right now that you have going out to liabilities, how fun would it be if you got to have all that money come back to you in income? There's a trade-off though, and this is the hard part. This is where a lot of people don't want to do this. We already went over the emergency fund because I feel it's really important to start there because we want to keep three to six months. And actually down here, I'll put a policy too. Forgot to add that. Okay. Three to six months of emergency stays on this side. Okay. But when we meet with people, we see, and I'm just going to put some numbers to this here real quick, just to make this real. Uh, let's say somebody's got 10 grand in a, in a checking. They've got their emergency fund of 30 grand. They've got a 401k with 100k. They got a brokerage account with 25k and they got a policy. I'm going to leave the policy off for right now, okay? I'm just going to leave that off. And over here in credit cards, they got 15,000 in credit cards, 5,000 in a line of credit, another I don't know, let's just do 10,000 in loans, a car loan of 25,000 and a mortgage of 300,000. Okay? So what do we got if we total these up? We got 100 55, 65, 165 in assets. Okay, and then over here, three, let's see, 25, 53, 55. Did I do that right? Close enough. We don't have to be exact here. Okay, here's what we got. So this person essentially is upside down. The money that they have in assets does not equal the money they have in liabilities. Oh, well, game over, right? That's where we stop. We just don't need to, we don't, we don't, we can't do anything. Well, here's the easiest thing to do. We look at all these assets over here. First and foremost, if you joined us for WTF this morning or any of the things, I think you know by right now, the stock market, your, your glorious S&P 500, it ain't gonna hold. It ain't gonna stay at these levels. It's going down, down, down like the Titanic, whether you want it to or not, whether you believe that it's gonna stay up, I don't care. I'm factually telling you based on the things that I know to be 100% true, the S&P is going down. So if you're at a high point in the S&P or in the stock market, what should we look at first? How about your retirement and your brokerage? Because let's protect the assets you already have. Because we do not want your 100,000 to go down and be worth, I don't know, let's say we don't want this going down to 75, do we? No. So in your 401k, most all of you that have a retirement account, as long as it's an employer-sponsored plan, you have a loan provision. You may or may not know about this, but you have a loan provision. And it's pretty simple. 
or 50,000, okay? Whichever is greater. So let's just say if you got 100,000 and you can take 50 or 50, it's the same thing. So we got 50 grand right here. Now, in, the interest rate when you take a loan from a 401k, I don't know what it is, but let's just call it 6%, okay? Does anyone know? Has anyone done this recently? Has anyone uh, taken a loan from their 401k? Can you tell me what the interest rate was? And I can use your number instead of mine. And if nobody puts it up there, I'll just use 6%. So we know we can take 50,000 bucks from the 401k at 6% interest. Great. We had a nine, we had an eight. Okay, so let's actually do that. Let's, it went up. Let's do eight. Over here, the 15,000 that we have in credit cards, what's the interest rate on this 15,000? I'm going to say 20%. 21 uh, is the average right now. 21%, it just came out. 21, let's use 21. I might need a little help with math because I like using round numbers and now we're going to have to do some math. So get the calcul calculator ready. All I'm right, ready. so we got 21% interest and what would be the minimum? So that'd be like 500 bucks probably. So we got 50 grand. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this $50,000 loan from the 401k that we're going to have to pay 8%. We're going to do that loan. Now, here's why. There's two reasons. First off, by taking 50 grand from your 401k, you have to get out of the market with 50 grand. It's forced. It will liquidate some of those mutual funds so that it frees up 50 grand so you can take the loan. You know what that is? It is selling high, folks. So don't be afraid of doing that. Oh my God, I don't want to sell those. I don't want to take a loan because it's going up and up and up. No, it's going to go down, down and down. So let's lock in the gains you have in your 401k. So the other reason people would kind of fight that is 8%. Like, oh my God, they're going to charge me 8%. Who's going to charge you 8%? Well, the 401k company is going to charge me 8%. No, they're not. Who does that 8% go to? So when you take a loan from a 401k and you got to pay it back with interest of 8%, who gets the 8%? Can anyone tell me? That's right. Christy said me. So what somebody would be saying if they said they don't want to pay 8% is they're saying you don't want to earn 8%. You don't want to pay yourself 8%. Okay. I don't know why you're here, but yeah, I want to pay myself 8%. So if I take a loan for 50,000, I got to pay it back with 8% interest. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take 15,000 of that 50 grand and I'm going to pay off the credit cards. I'm going to take the $500 a month that I used to give to the credit card. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that and I'm just going to tally them up over here. Okay. I'm going to move that $500 a month back to my asset side. That is now income coming back into your 401k. But how much did you make in that transaction? Okay. What's your return on that 15,000? Well, we already know the the 401k is charging to 8% or 8.5. Listen, the higher the number, the better, because it's just it's all coming back to your account. So you're making 8%. Is anyone making 8% in their 401k year over year, decade after decade, anyone? There might be a few of you, but on this 50 grand, you just locked in 8%, okay? But you didn't just make 8%. You see, you were giving $500 away to the credit card companies, which is 21%. So we made 21% because we took the 500 back, but the 500 represented 21% interest. So 21 plus eight is what? 29%. So you're effectively making 29% by taking that loan out. If any of you are making 29% in your 401k, please come work for me and tell me how you are doing that. But you're not, nobody is. So that's just 15 grand of it. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the rest of your loans Let's just say you got this loan. This is 8%. And this loan, your line of credit is 9%. So what we're going to do is we're going to take five grand from that 50 and we're going to pay off this line of credit. And then we're going to take the payment from this. Let's call that 100 bucks a month. And we're going to add that back to this. But that's 9%. Plus, you know, over here, the 8% that they were charging me. And we're just going to go right down the line. We're going to then pay off this loan. So what are we at? 25 30,000. So we're going to pay off this loan and that's going to come back. Let's say that's 200 bucks. So now we add 200 bucks over here. All this money is just going back into your 401k. And that was 8%. And some people would be like, well, I'm paying off a loan at eight and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm only making eight. Great. But it's, it's eight plus eight. It's not eight minus eight. You're getting the 8% already because you're paying it back to your 401k. That's mandatory. Plus you're recapturing the 8% you were giving away on the loan. 
So what do we got here? So 10, 25, or 30, 40, 50. So we can pretty much, can I just reduce this to make this a simple number? We now got a car loan for, so we got a car loan that was 20 grand. Sorry, I'm just making this simple. And the car loan was $500 a month. 20 grand would probably be more. And let's say that was only 3%. So now we add 500 here because you paid the car off. So now all the money from the 401k is now working for you. It is all giving you a return back. Stephen, can you do the math for me real quick? Yep. Okay, 21 plus nine plus eight plus three. Uh, 41. 41, okay. Divided by one, two, divided by four. 10.25. 10.25%. All I did, folks, is I averaged out the four different things that you paid off. It's 10.25%. I bet you any money that's very similar to what all of your numbers would be. But it's 10.25 plus eight. So it's actually... 18.25% that your 401k is making guaranteed. Any questions? Pretty simple, right? And you know, the cool part is, is this money, five, six, seven, eight. So we got 1,000, 1,300 bucks. Passive, right? That $1,300 that's coming in, you don't really have to work any harder for that. It's money you were giving away. So you just created passive income and you converted your credit cards your line of credit, your loans, and your car, you turned them into assets. All assets within your 401k. And that's all we did is the 401k. But we still got a mortgage down here for 300000 So we could address that later and start kind of looking at ways to do that. But let's leave the mortgage on the mortgage side. That's pretty cool. Do you ever feel like you don't have control of your real estate business or your money? That's right. The big banks and the institutions, they're in control, right? I know you've felt that before. Private Money Club puts you back in the driver's seat. As members often tell us, it's a total game changer. Join the community of like-minded lenders and borrowers by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. There's nothing hard about that. We could go all day long just doing that. Notice how I didn't talk anything about a specially designed whole life. I didn't talk about the infinite banking concept, but that's effectively exactly what you just applied. You took back the banking functions in your life by using Nelson Nash's concept called the infinite banking concept. Why? Because this banking function you gave up to the credit cards, this banking function you gave up to the banks, this banking function you gave up to the banks, and this ba banking function you gave up to the finance companies. You took back the banking function on all of those. And you took it back into one of your assets being your 401k. Why would you all not do that? Why? It just It would make no sense for you not to do that. Did I say that right? It would make no sense for you not to do that. Yeah. Does that make sense, everybody? Everybody understanding this? I mean, your numbers are going to be different, but our team, we could figure this out for you in 10 minutes on a phone call. So book a call with the team and we'll figure this out and we'll show you how to do this. Now, remember the numbers I showed you with the policy? Imagine if you did all of this just from a policy. Now, all of a sudden, all of that money is now working for you for the rest of your life. It's kind of kind of cool. Plus, you get the death benefit. I'm just trying yeah, to show you. And if you're like, I don't have a 401k, I mean, you can just move some of those assets around. I mean, even if you don't have a 401k, the brokerage at 25000 probably a good time to sell while the market's at its very tippy top peak-ish. Um, so drop that out of the brokerage. Now you have that twenty five freed up, maybe the 30000 you know, maybe you don't need that sitting in savings. So maybe we move that. So now we got 55,000 to work with. We put that into a policy of that 55. You might have 50 to pull back out. We do the exact same thing with that 50,000, pay that stuff off, pay ourselves back. And, and boom, you just did it without even using a 401k there. So there's Absolutely. different ways to move that money around to make this work. Thanks, Stephen. I love that. You know, I, I only did it from a 401k and I bet you there's 20%, maybe 30% of the folks on here that are like, I don't have one. So that doesn't work. But do you notice how I didn't just put just the 401k? I just started there because it's low hanging fruit. It's like walking in your backyard. You want an apple. There's all the apples at the top of the apple tree, but then there's that one right in front of your face. So what one are you going to take? Are you going to climb a ladder and get the high ones? Or are you just going to pluck the low hanging fruit? You're going to just take the apple that's the easiest to grab. How do I know this? I do it. Well, I was doing it every morning when I had apples on my apple tree. It's way easier. Okay. We're all inherently lazy beings, or maybe you just say, all right, well, I'm just going to work smarter and taking the low hanging fruit is working smarter. But if you didn't have a 401k, you could have done this from your brokerage account. You definitely could have done this from your savings account because everybody on here right now, I doubt there's anybody making 6% on their savings. So if your savings is making six, 
Is the 21% you're giving away to the credit cards more than the amount you're making in the savings? Yes. Is the, what did I figure this? 9% you're paying on the home equity line of credit. Is that more? Yes. So you see, all we're doing is math. We're just saying, all right, let's take money in a lower interest rate account and pay off a high interest rate account and then recapture the money back over so that your liabilities become your assets. And the coolest thing, this isn't hard. All you're doing is you're literally just repositioning where people mess this up and then say that what we teach isn't, which I haven't heard that in a long time because it works 100% of the time. Yeah, I actually, I don't remember the last time I heard somebody say that what we teach doesn't work. I really haven't, except for the people saying, oh, that's a scam, all oh, those stupid life insurance salesmen, oh, all they want to do is make a big commission on you. That stuff comes around, but they don't even know what we're talking about. And you know, they should, they should all put soap in their mouth. Remember the movie, you know, the, is that the Christmas story with Ralphie? where he gets the soap in his mouth, you know, because they all say, oh, that whole life stuff's garbage. Buy term, invest the difference. That policy I just showed you, remember that one that we were looking at a little bit ago on, on that client? Do you realize that that client in that example has $4.7 million, $4 million of the $6 million is term insurance? Like, dude, what do you think we're doing? We're just not investing the difference. We're just putting the invested amount into the same vehicle, earning a guaranteed return. Because I don't like the word investment because it has risk. We, we actually got a question on that too. I'll, I'll bring it up since you just brought that back up real fast in the Q&A. But um, before I get there, just the last thing I want to say on your little chart behind you is the savings. You know, people feel comfortable having that, you know, in savings as the quote unquote emergency fund. So maybe they don't want to pull that out to like pay off a credit card because now the money's gone. But remember, when you pay off the credit card, that now frees up the balance on that credit card or pay off the line of credit, it frees up the balance on that line of credit. So that money is still available to you. If an emergency happens, you can either pull it out of your savings or use the credit card or line of credit. There's no difference where that money comes from. It's just, would you rather be paying 9% or earning 6%? Well, why, why, why get a negative yield? You're just moving from one side to the other. Your net worth remains the same. Your emergency fund remains the same. So just keep it right there locked up. But Listen, so, I'm so, so glad you did that because that's exactly what I was going to show next with that little thing uh, that I did with my policies. Because exactly, like, an emergency fund is just when an emergency happens. You want the money sitting in the bank account. It's not working for you there very hard. It works for you really hard doing this. But like you said, Stephen, if you pay a credit card off that had 15000 how much money do you have available tomorrow? 15000 You pay a line of credit off for five grand. how much do you have tomorrow? Five grand. Is that not your emergency fund? Yes, it, you have to pay interest on it. But how often does an emergency actually happen that you need to go into the emergency fund? And there's definitely somebody on here who's like, man, Alvo, all the time, all the time we have emergencies. Well, yeah, yeah Chrissy, Christy just said it really well. This is not a cash system. It's a credit system. Your credit is your savings and your emergency fund. Oh, uh, yeah. She's awesome. And if any of you are not following Christy Van on Vantastic, go to YouTube and subscribe to her channel. Vantastic with two N's. Awesome channel. And there's a lot of people that we work with that we really can't help yet because they're they're living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe they got a scenario like this where they don't really have a lot of assets and they got way more money going out than they got coming in. Christy can solve that problem for you. I've seen it happen. I've, I've heard from her clients. We've heard from, I don't even, I don't know if I could say hundreds of her clients yet, but a lot of her clients and they just love her. So get around Christy's campfire and that is called fantastic. Actually, Christy's campfire is becoming our campfire, vice versa. We are becoming Christy's campfire. So it's pretty cool. You got a big merger going here. But what was that question about the term? Was somebody mentioning yeah, something? So about somebody him? just asked, like, what is the cost of the term on that policy per year? You know, I, I don't have I don't have that one because I don't have the illustration here. I just have the high level, but I've got this. Well, I've and, got and one of mine. While you're pulling that up, I mean sure. it's it's fine to ask what the cost is, but you gotta understand what that cost is doing for you. Without that term, we would never be able to build that policy with that cash value. So, you know, if you eliminate the term, when you put 500 in, you might have access to 200,000, where in our case, we have access to 447,000 or whatever it was. So whatever the actual cost of that term is, there's a reason. And what's your favorite saying, Chris? Cost is what? Cost is only an issue in the absence of value. 100%. Figure so out what your value is first, and then then that'll justify the cost. So I'll just give them this when they're asking. This is this is a real policy illustration. I did this on myself. Okay, so right here you can't really see it probably, but these are the costs. So this policy design was twenty five thousand to base, and then two hundred and twenty five thousand in term, ten year term, which is 
we'll either, either use a seven or a 10 year term rider because that's as long as we need the term insurance on the policy. Normally the paid up additions increase the death benefit enough in seven to 10 years where we really don't need the term and we don't need it for the MEC rules anymore. But in this case, this is on myself. This is a year old. So this is when I was 45 years old. I was a healthy non-smoker, just to put all the things out there. This $225,000 of 10 year term cost me $441. So in that example that I gave, it was 4.7 million. I mean, we can almost reverse engineer this because he's the same age I am. So if 225 was 441, then let's do this. Let's do 225 divided into, we'll just do 4 million. Just keep math simple. Okay. Times 441, if I did that right. So with that, I probably did it wrong. So let's do 4 million divided, doing my math the wrong way here. By 225, there we go, times, so that's 17 units at 441. This is not common core math, folks. I just want you to know your kids are not learning how to do that. This is called one plus one equals two. It's the math I learned back in the good old days in the 1990s. That's right, they taught us how to do division. Let me, let me repeat that. Some of you don't know what that word means. Division, yeah, look it up, Google it. They don't teach that in school anymore, kidding. So the term for that particular policy, that one we were showing, I'll put it up on the screen again, would roughly be about $7,800, simply doing the math, because term is term is term. It'd actually probably be a little less because there's breakpoints in term, but I did it on 4 million in term, and I just used the math on the one that I showed you and reverse engineered it. So probably between seven and $7,800 a year is what this term insurance would cost. Not too shabby, right? $4 million worth of coverage for $7,800. Maybe your family's worth that much. Maybe you're like, nah, I don't like them that much. And then I have to ask, why are you here? All right. Any other questions on my, which which is now turned into almost like this could be a piece of art, abstract art with all the lines and colors. <laughs> if anyone wants it, go into the highest bidder after. All right. When, when you take a loan out, do you then have both the loan payment and premium deposit due or does the loan payment cover the premium deposit? No, you have both. Because remember, the premium deposit is the amount you save. So the thing that's very, I love that question. It comes up a lot. A lot of people mix up. So right here, okay, let, let's just use this. Forget about the policy. Forget about the policy right here. You got a checking and a savings account. Every month you're saving 200 into the checking and then you're saving you know, 400. And I'm just making money, numbers up. This is what you save today. Four plus two, okay, 600 saving 600 bucks every month in your checking and savings, okay? So is that $600? If you, if you make your credit card payment for $500 a month, those are two different amounts, right? You're paying the credit card loan every month for 500 and you're saving 600 over here. Now, I'm just trying to help you with your mindset. Now we change one thing. We change where your savings goes first. Instead of 600 a month going into the checking and savings account, it goes into your policy. Then you take a loan from your policy and you pay off your credit cards, okay? You no longer owe the credit cards, but you're still saving money in your checking and savings. But now what you do is you take the 500 a month you used to give to all the credit cards and you put that money back in your policy as a loan repayment. You were giving away 21%, the insurance company is gonna charge you five. What's 21 minus five? 16, right? Did I do that right? 16%. You're making 16%. They're two separate payments. This is independent of your savings. Your savings is independent of the debts you're spending. So when you take a loan out, you have to understand, you never take a loan from your policy unless you have somewhere for that loan to go where it will work for you at a higher rate than what the insurance company charges you. And I say that loosely because that's not, a, that's not an iron fast rule. But if you're just looking at this for the first time, Jill and Tass and them, they're like, wait a second. It would make sense for me to take a loan from my policy, even if it was a 0% loan that I was paying back, just to take back the banking functions and the cash flow makes sense. Yes, but for the, the people hearing about this for the first time, let's just play general rules. You never take a loan out unless that loan, that money from your policy can work at a higher rate than what the insurance company is charging at 5%. Okay, simple, simple thing. So they're two separate things. But I love that question because we get asked that all the time. But just think about what you're doing now. We're not changing a whole lot. We're not making this complicated. It's exactly what you're doing today. Today, you're saving money. At least most of you on here are saving money. 
somewhere. It's, it's going somewhere. You're saving money in a 401k, a checking savings brokerage. You're just going to change where that savings goes, and it's going to go into your policy. When you take a loan from the policy, just like taking a loan from the 401k, it's going to pay something off or it's going to be used to make an, a return. That return or whatever you're paying off has to have a higher rate than what the insurance company charges. So 21 is higher than 5. 9 is higher than 5. 8 is higher than 5. It's pretty hard in today's world to find something that you have that's a debt that isn't a higher rate than 5%. We just live in a high interest rate environment. But the insurance companies don't mark their, their loan interest rate. It's not tied to prime. It's tied to the bond LIBOR, okay? The, li the, the bond LIBOR um, index, I think is what it is, or composite, whatever they call it. It's different. So it's great. How long would you continue to recapture that 500 you were paying to the credit card? Great question. Uh, Boyd, can I can I defer that question to the next one? Because I'm going to answer that in my next in my next example. All right, two more quick ones. Are you forced to pay back your 401k? Yes, unless you want to pay taxes and penalties on that money, you do have to pay your 401k back. If I take a loan from the policy, pay it back in one month, how long would I have to wait to get that loan again? As soon as your check clears, when it goes back to the policy. And you can take multiple loans too. So if you have cash value, 50,000 available, you take a 20, then you take a 10, then a three, then a seven. As long as there's cash value, you can take as many loans as you want. They don't require you to pay one back before you take another and et cetera. Cool. Dude, I don't even know how many loans I have on my policies. Like I've literally lost count. I'm not even kidding you. And I, and, and, so it doesn't matter. The insurance company will keep giving you loans as long as there's money in there. All right. So everybody's got that, right? It was a pretty basic thing. Some of you are are like my cat. You're just sitting there being like, oh my God, I know all this stuff. Can we get to the good stuff? Well, hopefully this is the good stuff because this is real. And you know, the best thing about what we do and one of my favorite things to do when we when it comes down to teaching is just show you what I'm doing. And I'm doing a lot of stuff, you know, between Brandon and Tess and Melissa on my team. Like we're always putting money in motion. We're constantly, constantly, constantly using the infinite banking concept to the point where me and Tess, I don't know if we're on a weekly call or a bi-weekly call, we're constantly going and I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell you we're doing this. I forgot to do, tell you we're doing this. Now, listen, I know that's me and it's, it's not your scenario, but I want you to all understand and remember one thing. Everybody of you listening to this right now, I started with $230 a month. I was broke. I was highly in debt. And that really wasn't all that long ago. It would have been about 2013, 2014. I officially started my first policy in 2004, but I've been doing this, the infinite banking concept since 2014, religiously. So I don't want anyone to look at my situations and be like, oh, you're so much further ahead. I'll never catch up. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. It's impossible for you not to catch up because I was right where you are, probably worse off than you were when I started this. So don't you ever tell me that I had something that you don't because I had nothing. Ask anybody that knew me back then. So let's get into this. What is that? Well, now we got fruit showing up. Yeah. yeah so um, this is kind of nice, man, from uh, my self-directed custodian, Horizon Trust. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Love it. <laughs> and I love that Felix just said something. He said, it's not a race. Getting wealthy is not a sprint. If you try to sprint your way to wealth, you will fail more times than you will succeed. Getting wealthy is about consistent, persistent action, about mitigating risk. I'm really good at mitigating risk. I take very little risk. I hate risk, but I consistently and persistently keep making little base hits. This base hit, that base hit. And let me talk, can I, talk, can I show you one of my base hits? This just happened over the last two weeks. This is something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I just had to do, I had to wait for my policies to regenerate some cash flow. Because remember, I take my policies, I lend the money out, or I pay off stuff. I recently just bought new cars. So in the last year and a half, we, we've replaced three cars. My wife got a new car, a nice one. I got a, a, a cool car. And then I've got a, a little sports car. My, my daughter calls it a race car. Okay, so I've got three cars all from my, my policies. So bought and paid for my policy. Then I got to regenerate that money with monthly payments that I pay back to myself as loan repayments. Key Bank is my bank, okay? They're a big commercial bank. You can look them up. They're publicly traded, okay? I've had a home equity line of credit on my mom's house, not my personal house. My personal home, I don't own it. It's the coolest freaking thing. People, people are like, whoa, what do you mean you don't own that house? I've seen it. It's like a, a big white and black house. Like, you don't own that? Nope. Nope, sorry, I don't. I know you all thought I owned a really nice house, but I, I control the house. I just don't own it. It's owned by my family trust. 
So I technically don't own it. So if any of you ever sue me and you want to take my house, you can't. You want to take our cars? You can't. I don't own anything. You can have cash, but you're probably going to give them back after you take them anyway. So I just don't own anything. But so over here, this home equity line of credit is on my mom's house. It is a 700 square foot, two bedroom, one bath house. And we have a $70,000 line of credit on that house. I've told stories before about how we use moms and it pays for her car, but I racked up a balance on this home equity line of credit of $68,804. Out of that, most of it was that, that race car that I bought, okay? Because I took money out of the home equity line and I bought a, my daughter calls it a race car or happy car. It is pretty happy. Anyway, doesn't matter what I bought with it, but the, the bank was charging me 9.24%. How many of you have a home equity line of credit that's about 9.24 now? I just want to remind you that a year ago, it was like five and a year before that, it was like three. Yeah, 8.99. There, Rick said it. So I'm at 9.24. So I've been looking at this thing. It's on an automatic payment. So from my checking account, it gets paid every month. Total amount that gets paid is $529.80 a month. And that is $6,357 a year. So I finally got to the point where I had enough money in my policies that I could pay this thing off. And I actually had a little extra. So let me kind of break that down. So that's what my liability was. It wasn't hurting me. I had the money to pay for it, but damn it, I hated it. I hated giving a traditional bank $529.80 a month. So over here, I, none of you are going to have what I have because I, I just wouldn't want you to, but some of us old folks that have been doing this a while, we have these things called cash value lines of credit. Yes, they're through a bank. Yes, it's like a home equity line of credit, but it's, it's collateralized by my policies. Out of my 10 policies, I have eight of those policies that are secured by a CD line of credit. Why do I do this? It gives me one direct point. I got one checkbook and one place to write checks to. I don't have to take loans from eight different policies. I take one loan with a check or a wire from that, that CD line of credit. And when I recapture money back, it's one place. So it's just simple, but there's a cost to that. I could borrow from my policies at 5%. The CV line of credit that I'm paying right now is 6.5. If you got a CV line of credit today, it'd probably be seven and a half to eight. So you can see why I don't want any of you to use a CV line of credit. So no matter what, all of you, if you do what I'm going to show you next, you're doing better than I am by one and a half percent. But I had, I recently paid a bunch of my policy premiums. So I had 101,000 available in cash value. I have like 400,000 out working, but I had 101 available. And then I have this policy, Security Mutual. Okay, it's a policy that we write in New York and we like the company that I had 23,000 available and I had the rest of that money out working. <laughs> so what we did is I did two notes. These are simple. And if any of you are on Private Money Club, you guys all can get a copy of these notes because we have samples of them. But here it is. This is a note, nothing complicated. Okay, just want to show you. And, and notice how on the back, it's, it's signed, signed by me. Now that might sound strange to all of you. Because you're like, well, wait a second, Chris, what, what's the note for? Well, the note is me taking money from my CV line of credit and from uh, Security Mutual. I do a note. Every time I take a loan from my policies, I structure a note. Now, sometimes the note is to somebody else. Sometimes it's to me. So this one is to me, the borrower, Christopher Noggle. And then my address, who's the note holder? Christopher Noggle's Security Mutual Life Policy Number, blah, blah, blah. And then... $22,790, okay? So $22,790 was the amount I took from Security Mutual. The note is for 9.24%. Does anyone know why it's 9.24%? Who can tell me why did I do a note from me to me for 9.24%? That's right, because I, I like simple. I was giving KeyBank 9.24%, so if I'm going to pay off KeyBank with my money from my private bank, why don't I just charge my private bank? Or why don't I just charge myself exactly what KeyBank charged me, right? It's simple. I do this with cars too. When I, when I take money from my policies and I buy a car, I just match whatever the dealership would have charged me in interest. And I negotiate that interest rate because, hey, make them do the work. So that's the first one, the monthly payment that I am paying back right now. Because what we did is we set this up where we have a loan repayment automatically coming from my key bank checking account back to Security Mutual for $175.48, okay? Second note I did, which is right here, this note, 
says the same thing. Borrower, Christopher Noggle. Note holder, Christopher Noggle, CV line of credit. And then I got the CV line of credit number. Uh, subject property used for note. Payoff key bank HELOC account number. $46,014.64. So $46,014.64. These are weird numbers. But why are they weird numbers? Because I'm just trying to match exactly what I owe KeyBank. That's all I'm doing. I'm just matching what I owe KeyBank. So I did a note. I signed the note. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I do this. Number one, if you've got a bookkeeper or a CPA or anyone, or you just track this, I put these in a three ring binder. So I always know this money is out working for this purpose. Because in a year, two years from now, I'm going to forget this. I'm going to forget how long these or what these notes were and what this, you know, I'll, by tomorrow, I'll forget what this dollar amount is. But I got a note that says that's not it. And if I ever got audited and the IRS is like, what is all this stuff? Here's the note right here. See, this is what it was used for. And you know why the IRS is never going to have an issue with this? Consult with your CPA or tax professional in your particular situations. But what my CPA said is because I'm not charging myself more than the bank did. As a matter of fact, there's an economic advantage of me doing this for myself because now I'm paying myself back 9.24. So what I do is I take this 68,000, which is the combination of these two notes, and I pay off KeyBank. <clears throat> KeyBank's gone. Now KeyBank has an additional $68,804.69. We did a webinar last night. And it was the most miraculous webinar. It was PMC. And we this guy, Jonathan, I found, I just found him on PMC. Like, you know, we were on PMC. I'll just show it to you because I don't, I won't, some of you weren't on there. So I went on PMC and I'm doing a training with Steven. And this deal caught, popped up. It caught my attention. 36 months, 18% amortized return, 44500 First thing in my mind is I'm like, wait, I got $44,500 in my home equity line of credit. And my home equity line of credit's 9.24. So 18 beats 9.8 or 9.24%. Maybe that's a good deal. We had them come on and explain the whole deal. Here's another deal for, I don't know what this return is, but they're all over the place here in Private Money Club. So all I need to do is find a deal that will pay me more than the interest the bank charges or the, the key bank charged me. So I have $68,000 that I can send to work in private money club. And I can make, in that case, 18%. It actually works out to be about 10% because uh, it's amortized, but we'll just use 18 because that sounds better because there are 18% deals. And then over here, all the money that comes back to my policies, all I did is I redirected the 529.80 that I used to give to KeyBank, which on the books is a liability. If I go to the bank to borrow money, which I'm not doing anytime soon, but if I did, this is the liability. The bank looks at this and says, ooh, yeah, you're, uh, you're in debt, Chris. You owe Key Bank $68,000, 529. Man, we just can't give you that loan. I did a whole thing recently showing you how banks are tightening. If any of you have gone to a bank recently, good luck. And in the future, the next year, two years, you're going to need good luck because banks are tightening heavily right now in preparation for a recession. Mark my words. Getting loans from banks is tough. So I got rid of the bank and I became the bank. And now I pay myself back the equivalent of 529.80 a month or 9.24% that comes back to my policies. Now here's the cool thing. And it's kind of the same because when I make a payment of 529.80 to KeyBank, do I keep 529.80? Do I get to use that the next day? No, that's just interest. That's just the interest payment. When I pay 529.80 into my policies, how much money do I get to use the next day? 529.80. When I pay back my line of credit, yes, <coughs> I would take the difference. So I would take 9.24 minus 6.5. Uh, let's see, 4, 8, 2, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 2.84%. I'm netting. That's my spread. I might have done the math wrong there, but I make 2.84%, the difference between what the CB line of credit charges me and what Key Bank charged me. Anyone want to pick up 2.84% for doing nothing but making your money go to work for you? And the best part is, is when that money comes back over here, it's available immediately for me to use. The money I pay back to my SML policy is even better. 9.24 minus five, that's a pretty good spread, right? So now that money is all available to me. But I, I re, now I also have another $68,000 available to me to go to work. See what I did? So now there was a question earlier, and this is where I want to address it. 
Some of you would look at this and you would say, okay, but if you were paying KeyBank on this HELOC, let's just say I was paying more than the just the interest. And let's say I would have paid this off for five years. Let's say if I was doing the normal payments to KeyBank on that home equity line, let's just say that home equity line would have been paid off in five years, hypothetically. Some people, when they do their notes for their policy, they would say, okay, I'm going to make these notes amortized for five years because that's what I gave to KeyBank. What is, can anyone guess what I do with mine? Does anyone know when I'm going to pay off my policies? Like, or, or better question is, does anyone know or want to guess when I'll stop making a $175 payment back to Security Mutual and when I'll stop making a $354 a month payment back to the CV line of credit? Any guesses? That's right. Never. Why would I? Why would I ever stop paying my bank back? Yeah, well, I shouldn't say never, but I have no intentions on stopping this. In the future, maybe if I get cash pinched or something, I'll take a break. I'll stop paying it. But see, here's the thing you got to understand. Every month, I'm used to making a $500 payment, $529.80 payment to KeyBank. Every month. Every month, I make that payment. I don't even think about it. It just comes out of my account. Now, I'm paying it back to my account. Do I ever want to stop paying myself 9.24%? Never. Never. And now I've got $68,000 that I get to sit here with me and my team and my underwriter and say, ooh, what looks good? Maybe Jonathan's deal looks good. Maybe Bill's deal looks good. Maybe Bo's got a deal. Maybe Chris Rude's got a deal. Maybe I'll just send that money to, to the, the Fullers. And you know the Fullers right now, based on the amount I have, are paying me 14%. So maybe I'll just send it to the Fullers at 14 because 14 is better than 9.24%, right? Was there anything complicated about what I just showed you? The only thing some of you are probably thinking is, oh man, I wouldn't know how to do that. I didn't in the beginning either. And pretty soon, probably in 60 days from now, you won't have to know how to do this. There will be a team, if you wanna hire them, they will do all of this for you. You can hire them for a month, you can hire them for six months, a year, you can just have them on retainer forever, as long as you want. It's going to be called the done for you team. We haven't come up with the full name for it, but for right now, we'll just call it done for you. They're going to do all this for you because you know who did all this for me? My team, the same team that will basically do it for you. So as Pace would say, or as we would say here, how do we know how to do all this for you? And what are we bringing you know, to the table for you? Everything that we do in our own life so that your life is easier, so that your family lives a better life. Because I, I don't know about any of you, but 529 bucks a month. Would that change anything in your life if you just tomorrow had $529 a month coming in? Would it? I don't know. Hold on. Let's go over here. If you recaptured all these payments, $1,300 a month, would that change anything in your life if just tomorrow your liabilities started paying you $1,300 a month and you didn't have to work another hour, you didn't have to take on any more risk or do anything silly? Would that change your life? I started in a worse place than probably 90% of you. The ninth. I love that Felix said when it's full. Felix is one of our money mentors. So he's, he's going down the rabbit hole an extra mile. He's right when, it, when it's full. But I'll make sure that it's never full. And I think what he's referring to is <clears throat> when I pay the loan back to the insurance company. And you know, the one thing I can guarantee you, Security Mutual or any of my other eight policies, none of them will ever be paid back in full. Never. Why would I let the insurance company hang on to the money when I can have the money working for me at a higher rate? Why? So the only thing that would ever make it so those policies get paid back is I get lazy. I, I don't know. I just stop having fun lending money and finding opportunities. But there's more forklifts out there that I want to do. You know, I want to try one of those semis. There's all sorts of things. I want to, you know, lend to this Jonathan guy and build a relationship. Chris Rude keeps sending me deals. I mean, the Fullers will always take my money. Dude, there's so many opportunities. So when people are like, I don't know what to do with my money. You're not around the campfire enough. That's all I got to say. And here's something really cool. I want Stephen to tell you a little bit about, because you know I poured a ton of value into you. I know I talked a lot. Some of your heads are spinning. Some of you are like, I don't understand this. We're going to answer the couple of questions. But the, the biggest thing we do every year is we do usually three or four three-day workshops. Okay, It's called The Essentials, Money School Essentials. It's a three-day virtual event. You can sit in your underwear on your couch and, and join us for the things. But this three-day that we've got coming up in November is epic. We, we're doing something we've never done before. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun because it's really going to bring home a lot of the things that we've never brought to you. And that is opportunities. Opportunities we are doing here. Opportunities we are using and putting our money in. 
and we're going to have those available to all of you. So Stephen, you want to talk about that for a second? Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of you have been on the three day, the Money School Essentials three day. Chris and I have been doing it since 2020, you know, when, when COVID hit and we decided to turn everything virtual. Uh, prior to that, we were teaching this class um, in person, actually, at uh, live events. And she kind of switched it over and made it a virtual event, which actually ended up being a lot more beneficial for you because A, the investment for it is very, very little. It's like 300 bucks. Plus, we got some really cool stuff going on as an early bird special today. Um, B, it costs us a lot of money to fly in all the experts to teach in person. So now we can just invite them uh, via Zoom to join us for the weekend. And so you get access to a lot more experts, a lot more opportunities, and you can learn from more professionals and, and multimillionaires about all these different strategies. And so it's really cool what we've been able to do. And we've been doing it quarterly now since 2020. And um, we've made it better and better each one. I mean, we have... You know, I'll let people speak to it themselves in the chat box, but we have people that attend the three-day training every single quarter and they, you know, they pay for it each time. Like I said, it's, it's not much, but the reason they do that is because there's always something new and we don't regurgitate the same information. Like the economy is constantly changing. The, 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 the global markets are constantly changing. So we always have to bring new information, new strategies and so we have some really cool uh, new speakers coming on for this three day. But more importantly, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of time teaching and training on Friday and Saturday. And then we're going to make Sunday kind of full of some opportunities, which, which we've never done before. So we're kind of what we're basically doing is we're taking private money club and we're implementing it into our money school essentials three-day foundational training course which i think is going to be awesome so on sunday we're like lining up a bunch of opportunities for you to learn about so you're going to learn how at the three-day how to not only take back control of your money and keep more of the money that you're making but also have opportunities to start deploying that money and having that money now start making more money for you so over those three days it's going to be really cool we have extended it a little bit so it starts at 10 a.m eastern each day we used to end at two uh then we started ending at three now it's going to probably end a little closer to four so it is getting a little bit longer but the cool thing is when we do record the entire thing we give you the recordings like that night or the next morning once they're done processing um in the back end so you get the recordings immediately you can keep the recordings forever so you can refer back to it if you miss any parts of it you can go watch them anytime that you want so i'm super excited for this one coming up chris and so what we decided to do today um is we decided to give you guys like a really cool early bird special and so first off we have a discount code for anybody that signs up today it's the early bird discount um it's final 23 f i n a l 23 is the discount coupon code and i'll put it in the chat box in just a second and show you guys how to do this and then for anybody that's on today we always like to reward uh, people that take action and so first off, all of you took the time out of your Wednesdays to be here till the end with us right now. So I know a few people hopped off. Well, they're going to miss this. So those of you that stuck around with us, you guys are going to get a free BYOB limited edition hat as well. So we'll give you $100 off the investment to take the three-day course. And we're going to send you, we're going to mail you a special limited edition uh, BYOB hat. So it'll be similar to like one of these that we always wear, uh, but it'll be special for this money school three-day training. Um, so with that being said, I will put that in the chat box and then I'll pull up the screen and kind of show you a little bit more about it. But yeah, so go ahead and buy your ticket now. Um, like I said, if you think you might not be able to make it that weekend or have other things going on, we do record it. Um, and then you, you get access to some other stuff with it as well. I don't even know what we give you anymore, but we give you a bunch of value uh, for enrolling in the class. So let me just share my screen and kind of just show you some of the people. This isn't a hundred percent updated because we are adding some new speakers as we as we speak but um so the money school three days so this is the link i just put in the chat box so just go over there you can kind of check it out a little bit what's going on this is the schedule for the three days so uh day one will go till about 4 p.m uh day two will go till about 4 p.m and day three will go till about 4 p.m so just kind of expect that these are eastern uh eastern standard time right i think we switch back maybe that weekend actually saturday night maybe we switch switch over to daylight time or vice versa but anyways um, so this kind of shows you some different speakers. We're going to talk a lot on Friday about controlling your money, where your money is, um, you know, where you can access it, things like that. And then Saturday, we'll start presenting some different opportunities, strategies, investment 
techniques. And then Sunday, we're going to, um, you know, protecting your money, uh, keeping more of your hard-earned money, but then really get into some of those opportunities and uh, what that looks like. So super excited for this one. Uh, just some different testimonials. Like I said, we've been doing this for a few years now. So we have literally hundreds of testimonials. I always tell people like, if you're not happy with the class, we're happy to give you a hundred percent of your money back. Um, Chris, you know, we've never, I mean, we've literally had thousands of people take this class now with us and we've never had a single person ask for their money back. No, and so. we've, we've offered that every single time, every time yep. nobody's ever, take, nobody's ever wanted their money back. Yeah, so Christy will be there, Noah, Kevin, Matt, you know, Brent, Greg, some awesome people. Like I said, there'll be a lot more people on than just this, but it just kind of shows you kind of some of the stuff that you get with this. So go over there, click on reserve your seat, put in your information, and then uh, put your mailing address here, mailing address, uh, because we want your mailing address so we can mail you that free hat. So as soon as we get it, we'll mail you over a hat. And then down here at the bottom, put in your credit card information and... Uh, let me find where the discount. Did you show them the hat, Stephen? Because it's not just a normal hat. Like when you say it's a hat, the hat. I don't are... know which one we're giving away. I know it's going to be something like this. I just we way have some better. Hair. Yeah, I sent you the ones last night that we're going to do. It's 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 a hat none of you have ever seen. Very unique and very expensive hat. They're thirty dollars. Oh, that's right. Just so sorry. Them. So real fast, just on the end of this, real fast. So you, you you'll notice there's nowhere to put. It's at the very top. So it says have a coupon. So it's at the very top right here where you put in the coupon code. So if you click that. And then put in final 23, apply coupon. And then when you go to the bottom, you can see it takes $100 off. So do that. Put in your mailing address right here, and we'll mail you that hat. Sorry, man. I got excited about the new hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure. Yeah, so we got, I, I you know, it is going to be a limited edition hat. So, um, and that, just so you know, if you're watching the recording, th this is only good for people on this live webinar right now uh, that get the hat. The early bird discount will be good through, I believe we're doing it good through um, like the 21st, maybe. Or I think we might be doing it good through Halloween, but um, but make sure you get advantage, take advantage of the discount as well. So get in on that. And I wish I had a photo of the hat. That's pretty epic. Um, all right. So I want to hit this one question. Sarah, <clears throat> we get this a lot too. I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. Sarah said, can you show how this would work with a mortgage? If that's the only debt left, is it worth so? And is it worth it if the mortgage rate is three percent? This is perfect. We've been talking about this a lot lately, and I just want to show you the math. So, Sarah, the one thing I don't know is how long have you had that mortgage, but I want to just show you on the screen. Just because you think that you're paying three percent, because that's what your your mortgage interest rate is, you're not paying three percent. And I want to prove it. Bankrate.com just a website. And this is just a mortgage amortization table on like a $400,000 house <clears throat> where you put money down. So here's essentially the balance. I, I just want you to look at this. Okay. 2023, if this was the first year that you're uh, buying the house, the first year, that's how much principal of every payment goes. And that's how much interest goes. <clears throat> so if we divide the principal into the interest, 60, almost 69% of every payment is going to interest only. So are you really only paying 3%? Well, that's the interest rate. But you see you're losing to the volume of interest. And then here, let's just do this next year. So for the first seven years, this is what you're going to see. So we take 82.95.95.92.95.95 and divide that into the 11,766 in interest that you've paid. 70%. I'm just doing simple math that all of you can do. So if we if we just keep doing this, I just want to show you that although it looks like you're only paying 3% because that's what you you were sold as a 3% mortgage, you're paying a lot more. I mean, look at these. Okay, that's 20. So one, two, three, four, five, six, here's seven years right here. So even in the seventh, so in the seventh year in this one, you pay 47,000. 325, divide that into the 58,000 in interest you pay, 716, 80%. So in the first seven years, you hear us talk about this all the time. In the first seven years in your mortgage, 80% of every single payment went to interest. 20% of every single payment went to, to principal. Are you really paying 3%? I think not. So when people don't want to pay a mortgage off because it's a low interest rate, which most of you have a low interest rate on your mortgages, 
It's not low because you're losing to the volume of interest. I'm, I'm literally just showing you the math. I mean, this is, this is not my website. I didn't create these numbers. I did it while Stephen was talking. There it is. And, and we could play this game going on and on. I'm trying to see where it breaks even. I mean, my God, I'm down to 2035 and I'm still upside down in what I'm paying. Yes, you're wow. paying your, your principal down, but look at it. From 2023 to 2033, let's just do 10 years. How much did you pay your mortgage down? It went from 338 to five or 256. It's not even $100,000 less. <clears throat> and how much money did you pay in payments? I'm not going to do the math, but you'd add up 83 plus 91. And I think all of you know that that's a lot more than less than 100,000 being paid down. You're giving up the volume of interest. Christy Van would probably know the math. She'd know exactly what you're paying for a mortgage in any given time because that's what she does. That's why I'm telling you to get around the campfire. But Sarah, hopefully that helps a little bit and just gives you kind of some reference points as to why what you see is not always what you get and how the volume of interest is killing you on your mortgages. You know, right now, like I'm hot to trot. I just had a conversation with uh, the Done For You team. I got two mortgages, <clears throat> commercial mortgages on rentals that are coming due. So they're going to go from 5% to 8%. So what we're doing is we're figuring out how much money we can get into the policies with loan repayments to then pay off those loans and just take back control of those two as well. Dustin said, are the loans from your policy simple interest? Yeah, I almost always do simple interest. I do have one amortized loan and that's for the copy machine. And I just did that amortized because it's a, it's a company loan. So on the books, I wanted an amortized loan that matched the lease that I would have done with that copy machine for five years. But I almost always, th these two that I showed you are simple interest. So these are almost all the loans I do are simple interest. 8%, yep. Awesome. So one last time, folks, this is that limited offer to get into the Money School Essentials. There it is. Stephen put it up. I just put it up. And we'll mail you that really amazing hat. It is not a hat that's going to be available to the public. It's one we're going to do just for this. So it'll be a special one-off hat that you know you can wear and be like, people say, oh, where do I get that hat? And you say, sorry, you can't. That's what we're trying to do is do really cool stuff like that. Is done for you team separate from mapping team? Yes, it is. So Jeanette, great question. So any of you that are already a client, you know this, but any of you that are not a client of the money school or money, money multiplier, we have a program or a team called the mapping team. We call them the I team, the implementation team. So you're going to get the implementation for free. They will map out all your debts. They'll, they'll put them into a format like you've seen in the 90 minute video with the chiropractor. They will do a cash flow analysis and they will meet with you to update your map four times a year, once a quarter. What they will not do is they will not do all the work for you. They will not do every, they won't track everything. They won't do the bookkeeping for you. They won't do the notes and all that stuff. They won't do it all for you. It's, it, here's the difference in, in here. Let me describe the difference between the implementation mapping team and the done for you team. It's fishing. So if any of you have ever gone fishing with somebody, you go out and they take you fishing and you've got your own pole, you got your tackle box and they got theirs. Now, they might have fished a lot longer, so they'll tell you, hey, the fish are going to be over in that corner, so cast over there. Here's the worms, or but I would probably use, uh, I would use crawfish, you know, and they give you the, the cup full of the crawfish. They're not going to put on the crawfish. They're not going to put your worm on. They're not going to cast your pole, you know, so that all you have to do is enjoy the fun stuff. You learn how to do it. So they're going to teach you how to fish, but then you do the act of fishing. Yeah, that's the, the mapping team. They're going to teach you how to fish, and then the rest is on you. The done for you team is if any of you have ever gone out with a, a fishing guide, it's, it's amazing. They take you out on their boat. They literally have it all laid out. They have food and, and drinks for you. Um, they will literally take you right to the spot. They will put the bait on the hook for you. They will tell you exactly where to cast. When you hook a fish, they will net the fish, pull the fish out of the water, hold the fish, ask you, would you like to hold the fish? Can I take a picture of you with the fish? That's the done for you team. They do it all. And then they'll, throw the fish back in the water, put your bait on and do it again. That's the difference. But when you go out with a guide, you indeed paid the guide for that service. The done for you team is not free. There will be four different levels, okay? One which will be like kind of an intro basic level all the way up to the most advanced levels, which will cost, you know, whatever it costs on a monthly basis. It just depends on what level of service you need. And then for however long you need it, it's a monthly retainer service. You can retain them for a month, 
three months. You can just have one particular deal you want them to do, retain them for a month. You get your deal, you're done. But I can tell you right now, because I'm doing it, you'll fall in love with it. And you will want to add that to your normal monthly budget because they will they will literally make your life so much easier and allow you to do a lot more with your private banking system. So great question. That's awesome. Um, so he's just asking about uh, Money Tank next spring as well. Uh, we don't have the dates set for that yet or, or the experience, which will be in the spring also. Um, but Money Tank will definitely be out in Utah. Uh, we just got to wait on the dates, probably mid-April at some point. And then the experience will be in a tropical climate. We're looking at maybe like January, February, and uh, either like Florida, possibly the Bahamas, but something tropical. So um, still kind of looking into some some locations for that as well. But uh, those, those will be the next live in-person events uh, that we have we have to kick off the new year. Um I know, Chris, you're looking at doing a pop-up event in Dallas, right? Yeah, Coming oh, up. yeah. Here, let me wrap this up. This everybody stay with area. me. If you're from Texas, please stay on. But everybody else, thank you for joining us for another Wealth Webinar. Lazy Cash was so excited you were here. He just can't stop talking about how excited he is that all of you have joined us for this campfire. But unfortunately, we have to say goodbye, but only for about an hour and a half because at 4.30, we're going to be going live again on Ask Me Anything to answer the rest of your questions. So we will see you at the Ask Me Anything. But until then, thanks for joining today. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.